Okay. Um, welcome, SciCommerce, um, to our June mentor chat. Um, and today we are joined by uh, Boston University Public Relations Professor Justin Joseph. Um, and so hopefully with this conversation, we'll get a chance to see how we can use um, public relations and um, kind of crisis control and mediation um, skills for our own science communication. Um, Justin, the floor is yours. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tyler. Thank you to all the SciCommerce. Thank you for having me uh, join you for, for today's event. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. I'm going to share my screen quickly so that we can have some visuals as well as we go through our, our, our event for today. So please bear with me as I do that. I'm sure if you've been doing work of any kind over the last couple of months or years, you've probably had this question about your own communication. Uh, questions that might uh, range in a variety of ways about external comms. How do I get my work out there? How do I get people to hear about it? How do I get people to know about the importance of the work I'm doing, the research I'm involved in, or even the organization that I'm working for? Uh, I've spent the last 20 years or so working in this area of public relations, this idea of communicating to various audiences, whether they're investors, government, media, employees, how do we communicate our messages effectively, uh, especially if we have complex messages that need to be communicated in a way that's understandable to many different audiences? And so a lot of that work has been focused in on this area that addresses a series of questions. How do we draw media interest and attention to our research and our programs? How do we communicate complex ideas to a variety of audiences? And how do we prepare and respond to media questions? I'm assuming that most of you have already thought about this in some way, taken coursework in this, or even had to do it in many regards. Uh, even if it's in the area of crisis communication, what happens if something that I'm working on uh, has some implications in the media that might be less than positive, where a reporter or journalist might be asking questions about my work and questioning the validity of my work or the ethics around my work? How do I answer those questions? How do I respond in an effective way? What I'd like to do for these next couple of minutes together is really just uh, dive into this idea of messaging, how we can message our work and make that messaging effective to many audiences. And so we'll talk a little bit about messaging today. One of the things I always like to do in sessions like this is uh, to make sure that it's completely open. So if you feel that you'd like to ask a question, please don't hesitate to do that. I am more than happy to address those as we go through. Uh, if for any reason I don't see your question or anything like that, please, uh, please just raise up a hand or even cut me off in the middle. I'm so happy to address those questions as we go through. But if you've ever watched, uh, even if it's an, uh, a health tech company, talk about a new product or a pharmaceutical brand, talk about the efficacy of a vaccine, or if it's even a public health official explaining the importance of a public health campaign or initiative, you've always seen messaging at work. And when a when a person is speaking well on behalf of their product, service, or campaign, you're probably seeing really strong messaging as they're doing that. One of the things I'd like for us to address is, to, or at least to get our conversation going, is to start thinking about the headlines that you see when it comes to science and communication. Those headlines can help drive our way of thinking because if you're a journalist or if you've worked with journalists ever, you know that a journalist is likely thinking in the form of headlines. What would be a way to grab attention, keep attention, have a person click through a story, read through a story, what would be of most interest to my audience? And if an editor or a journalist is thinking that way, then you as a communicator should also be thinking that way. And so if you look at some of the headlines that we've seen in recent months and, and years around health topics, you're probably going to see that there's something about them that's truly different, unique. There's a uh, look, look, that first headline, BUCTE study, that genes may play a major role in CTE severity, or that CNN headline about people who sleep five hours or less a night face higher risk of multiple health problems as they age, or even the Scientific American piece that some people really are mosquito magnets and they're stuck that way. Think about what you're seeing in each of these headlines. Something is happening that makes this media outlet say this is a story worth covering, and there's something that's happening simultaneously that makes the reader believe this is something I'd like to click on, learn about, and add to my own knowledge base as I see it. And all of that is grounded in messaging. It's grounded in this idea that whenever we are releasing a message, that message has to be a frame, a, a foundational element that we're building all of our other communication off of. 
uh, working in this industry for a long time, I'll tell you one of the things I typically see, and I work with a lot of executives and and people in the C-suite who tend to believe that they know their company really well. They know their product or their service really well. And what they'll do is they'll just run into a conference or they'll run into an event and they'll say, I'm ready to talk about this product or service. And then they'll walk away an hour or two later and go, that was a disaster. I, I wasn't really prepared for the questions that came. I didn't realize our investors were gonna ask things along that regard. And I feel like I messed up in the Q&A session. And oftentimes the problem can be traced back to one simple one simple issue, that their messaging was off. They didn't have their messaging down. They didn't know what to message around. So this afternoon, let's start really with the basics here. What does a key message feature? This is something that we spend a lot of time thinking through and understanding. And we do it by watching great uh great Q&A responders, great public speakers, great spokespeople. Here's what they typically do. They will build a key message around these two elements. One, a valuable asset that we bring, meaning our organization, our research, our work, one valuable asset that we bring, and we'll directly tie it to an audience need that exists at the same time. So let's think that through one more time. It's not just me going out there and saying, my company is the best, my work is great, or we are clearly the best at doing blank, blank, and blank. It's much more than that. It's you tying a valuable asset to a key audience need. And when the two come together, that's where key messages are formulated. That's where we're able to speak about our research, our work, our, our companies. We're able to speak about them in a much more coherent way because we're talking much, much more than a company. We're talking about a solution to a real problem. And that's how we're framing so many of our key messages. So let me give you an example of what that might sound like. If you have a new product or service in the telemedicine space, for example, it's very easy to go there and say, we have the best features and we have the best, um, we, uh, we, we have the ability to cut through the clutter and help you get the best care. If, if that's what we're going to talk about, we've got to break away from our technology, our prices, and start to focus in on how it solves an important audience need. If your telemedicine platform helps people get better health outcomes, that's what you want to tie it back to. So you're going to go back to the key message of, for each of our patients, we offer the most convenient and cost-effective way to receive the highest health outcomes. And then I'll talk a little bit more about how we back that up. So let's remember again, a key message features one of your valuable assets along with one of your audience's needs. If you go back to those headlines that we saw just a second ago, this is kind of how these headlines are formulated, right? You're starting to see that there's something interesting that deals with people in every one of them that, that deeply ties back into a person or something a person might face. And then there's going to be a little more information around what those people could do to benefit their own lives. There's this concept we call andragogy, the, uh, the how adults learn. And how adults learn is tied deeply back to messaging, right? Adults typically have an inbox mentality where I will gain information. I will quickly process that information to figure out, is this something that can help me immediately? If it's not, I will process that information right out. Now, when it comes to something like messaging, this is what we want to be thinking about. The people who consume our information want to know is this going to help me soon? That's something that most people are asking. And the truth is, you've probably scrolled through dozens of headlines today. You've probably scrolled through dozens and dozens of posts from different people today. Why did you stop at the ones you stopped at? You thought there was something that has an immediate impact on your life, and that was likely where you stopped. And so this is why key messages should feature your valuable asset and an audience need. Beyond that, I'll share that all of your key messages should be these three things. They should be precise, accessible, and satisfying. And I, I want to explain each one very quickly for us today. If you think about all the things you could say about your work, about your research, and about all the future research you will do, you're going to have so many things to say, and it's going to it be inundating about the paragraphs and paragraphs you could write about the work you've done. Why? It's your work. You're interested in your work. You're deeply motivated to promote your work. And so because of that, the problem is going to be, how do I get as much into this as I can is going to be a likely temptation that you face. The truth is great key messaging is first of all, precise. Precise meaning that it's clear 
and it's concise. It's very easy to consume. It's the way that uh, some of you have been trained even from an early age to say that if you have a scientific uh, explanation that you have to give, make sure that a fifth grader could understand it. You've probably heard that at some point before. That mindset, while I don't have to, well, we don't have to say you have to always speak to a fifth grade level because in many cases you might be speaking to your colleagues. So I don't want to say that that's what we're saying, but we're still talking about precision. We're still talking about can I use the most precise words to get to the point? If I start talking using larger words with a lot of beating around the bush and not getting to the point, my message gets lost. And remember how an adult thinks. An adult thinks if this does not make sense or have an impact on me immediately, I'm not likely to continue using it. So precise means trying to get your message boiled down to as few words as possible. Uh, there's this idea of I want to use maybe five, six to eight words to boil down how precise this idea is. And once I get to six to eight words, I try to get it even less if possible. Now that's not always going to happen, but I want it to be precise. I want that idea that I'm trying to portray to be sharp and easy to understand. Secondly, I want it to be accessible. Accessible means language that anyone can understand really. It's really about that idea of, I want to cut through the clutter of jargon. I want to make sure that I'm not using industry specific terms and acronyms that most people would not likely understand or, or get. I want to cut through that a little bit. And then I want to make sure that my messaging is satisfying. Satisfying simply meaning that when someone reads it, they get it and they want to do something as a result of it. And so how can I get my messaging to be satisfying, to be something that someone wants to hear? If you think about that mosquito headline we read a minute ago, there's something about that headline that makes a person want to click on it and read that story. It's built around this idea, this notion that yes, there's something interesting here, but there's also something I can do as a result of it. If we're finding out that mosquitoes are more attracted to certain people, I wanna know what type of people. And if we're finding out that mosquito bites can be pre prevented, I wanna know how. And we're, we're, we're scratching that curiosity in people's minds and that's satisfying. And that's part of what we're doing with our key message. So again, we're trying to be precise with the language, trying to get to the point quickly. We're trying to be accessible by not using a uh, language that's unnecessary. Uh, we're try not trying to be cumbersome with what we're trying to say. And then of course, we're trying to be satisfying, meaning that there's some benefit to reading this or hearing what's about to be presented. So that's how we're looking at key messaging. So now, how does this affect you? This is where I would encourage you as you're even continuing through your work. And you might be thinking to yourself, look, I'm not a spokesperson. That's not really my, my, my gifting. That's not something that I'm capable of doing. And if that's you right now, I wanna encourage you by saying that that's actually how most people who are spokespeople today felt at one point. They often feel that I can't talk that's not what I'm good at. I'm a much better researcher. I'm a much better writer than I am someone who communicates these ideas verbally. Well, here's what I would encourage you to do. I would encourage you to take a step back and start to think through all of your work and start to think through what are the likely questions that would come up when it comes to this work that we're doing right now. Now, if your research focuses on, let's say, a public health issue like malaria or HIV AIDS transmission or something like that, you want to start to think about what needs to be communicated. Uh, go back to the why. The why is really what gets people interested. And this is especially true when you are talking to journalists or influencers about your research. Uh, you're appearing on a podcast one day and the podcast host starts asking you, um, so tell me about your research. Now, tell me about your research sounds like a natural question to start answering okay, so two years ago, we set out to do the following and we hired the following people, we used the following systems and we came out with the following results. But I would encourage you to take a step back. Even if the podcaster is asking you what you're doing, answer with why you are doing this study. I think the why is critically important and it helps to lead the headline that could be written. It really leads, leads that reader, that listener, to start thinking about what could potentially be learned through the headline that could be coming. So why are we doing this study? Start there. Start thinking about the bigger problems that are being solved through the work that you're doing. One of the things that we always stress is that if you have an option of highlighting your solution or highlighting the problem that exists, 
I would encourage you start by highlighting the problem wherever you can. The more you talk about the problem, the larger the problem becomes in the mind of the reader and the consumer, that's when you can start to elevate your solution. But you've got to start by elevating the problem. Uh, this is something we do in the health tech space a lot. This is something we do in the pharma world a lot. If you can elevate the problem, you naturally elevate your solution. So start by asking this question, why are we doing this study? Who will benefit? How will this benefit society? How is this research different? One of the things that you'll often hear, um, especially if you ever engage in media training of any kind, is this idea of speaking in superlatives. You've probably heard it before. You've seen it many times before. This is the first research of its kind. This is going to be the highest implementation of this result that we've ever had. You're starting to use those EST words, those, those uh, superlatives. Start to see how you can differentiate your research. And when you start to talk about your work, when you start to create strong messaging, start to think about the why. Why are we doing the study? Think about the audience. Who will benefit from this? And then how is this research different? So you'll notice I'm not talking specifically about what you're doing. We're talking about why you're doing it, who will benefit from you doing it, and what are the differentiators of what you're doing? Now you're building interesting messaging. Of course, the what is something that you're going to talk about. But for now, you're starting by talking about what makes this unique. Why are we doing this? And who will benefit from us doing this? One of the best ways to create good messaging, uh, and I want to encourage you to try this, is to write down the most obvious questions that could come up from your research. So start to think through... If I was going to pitch this to a podcast host uh, on science in, in the world of science communication or science journalism, what would I do? Uh, what would that person likely ask me? So start to brainstorm some of those obvious questions that could come about, and then we'll work together in just a little bit on how to answer those as well. So start by deciding what needs to be communicated. Then from there, the next step I want to encourage you to take is to create these short summarizing sentences. Thinking about why are we conducting this research? Thinking about who will benefit from this research? What is the value of this research? I've provided a quick little sample there. Um, my, my wife is a nephrologist, and so she works a lot in kidney diseases. And so one of her, her, her big areas of, of study has always been in this area of chronic kidney disease, uh, something that affects 37 million people. But the truth is, I, I am married to her, and if you asked me, how many people suffer from chronic kidney disease? I would have guessed like a thousand because I didn't know. It just does not seem to be a disease that rises up in the in the level of elevation of importance. Yet 37 million people are struggling with this disease. Now, part of what she needs to do with her research is she needs to figure out how to elevate the problem and then start to talk about the solutions that could exist there. So I've, I've created these three um, artificial message points to to see what it could sound like, these short summarizing sentences that will lead to clear messaging. We are conducting a research study to see if taking a daily pill can safely protect people against chronic kidney disease, right? It's precise language. It's not talking about all the other things which are clearly important, but we can get to those things. We're starting with the most clear idea of what's going to take place. Why are we doing what we're doing? Then the study is committed to strengthening our understanding of chronic kidney disease, discovering preventative measures and advancing care. Now that's written okay, but I would say that that's still using a lot of big words, especially if I'm talking to a media audience or a podcast audience, I'd wanna be very careful about how much big wording I'm using when I could just get it right down to this idea that if this medication proves to be effective, it could provide a new way to prevent and combat the effects of a disease that currently affects 37 million people. We've suddenly shown the value to society, the value to the people around us by doing this type of work. So start to think through first again, ask the right questions, create the short summarizing sentences, and then we're going to start developing the supporting messaging. So let's make this dichotomy very clear here. Key messages are really, again, your valuable asset combined with an audience need. That's how we're going to create these key messages. Then we're going to develop supporting messages. This will go under each of your key messages. So next time you're called in to speak at a conference or answer questions from an audience or you are being asked media questions, you're not going to walk in completely unarmed. In fact, you are completely prepared when you have the key message 
supported by what we call supporting messages. And in just a second, I'll help you understand what's, what a supporting message is. You'll notice in these supporting messages that I've placed in front of you, you're going to find stats, data to be a big part of how supporting messaging is constructed. So in this case, chronic kidney disease currently affects more than one in seven US adults. Nine out of 10 people with CKD do not know they have it. Uh, a little bit about the medication itself. And then of course, a story about a patient who took the medication. So you're seeing the supporting messaging holds up the key message that's being utilized. And so, uh, you know, oftentimes I would help uh, doctors or, or C-suite members and at my organizations help them go and speak at a conference where there was going to be live Q&A. And this is what we would do. We would start with that strong foundational key message and then build the key message and hold up the key message with supporting messaging. In fact, if you'd like to know what supporting messaging looks like, it's really built around three key areas for most communicators. It's this idea of statistics, stories, and sound bites. Statistics, that's an easy one. You're probably working in that area constantly. So you're very well versed in statistics. You understand that. One of the things I would encourage you to do when it comes to your statistics is make them real. Uh, one of the things that often happens in cases is that we're using numbers and percentages without any sort of context to the number or percentage. And when you do that, that andragogy kicks in again. Your audience hears the number, can't fully wrap their heads around the number, and therefore ignores the number. So I, I've seen this happen before where um, I, I remember an organization that was working with illiteracy, and one of their statements that they had was that um, there, there was this issue where roughly 60% of people in a specific city were struggling with reading and with literacy. And rather than saying 60% in that community were struggling with illiteracy, they had this piece, this little infographic that they released to a daily publication. And the, the infographic had a simple photo that if you are reading this on a train, that the person either to your right or to your left is struggling with illiteracy right now. And so there was this call, this push toward the problem, and it was bold and emboldened through statistics. One of the things I want you to think about is how do you make your statistics more real? The truth is percentages are often the toughest to really wrap into context. So maybe walking away from percentages, maybe is it a ratio? Is it a way to show uh, what that number could actually be? I remember the Alzheimer's Association recently in Boston, a couple of years at this point, decided to show how many families are struggling with Alzheimer's disease. And rather than putting out a number, they showed that a this specific number of people could fill Fenway Park, I think it was something like 137 times. And by showing that visually and by showing this data point in a way where you could almost wrap your head around and say, wow, that's a lot of people, they were able to drive donations and a lot more awareness around the problem. So statistics, make them real. The second supporting message type that is very important to key messaging is a story. Uh, we see this often, and we've studied this often, that stories are powerful because stories are remembered. Uh, there's a lot of data around recall, this idea of remembering what was uttered or what was said. Stories tend to get remembered, and you're probably well aware of this. Now, if I told you about a... Uh, a, a study around a specific medication and that this medication was very effective. And I told you that it had a 17% improvement in certain, in certain symptoms. You might remember that. But if I told you the story of a patient and their outcomes, their results, and their life now as a result of that medication, you're much more likely to remember that. So building stories or examples or anecdotes into your messaging will be critical. The final thing I'll say here is sound bites are so important. If you're not familiar with that term, sound bites are really just uh, when we phrase things in a way that's quotable. That's how we want to be thinking about our supporting messaging. And this can go for anything. It really doesn't have to be just for your research. It can be even the way that you present yourself in a job interview. It's really about sound bites, about this way of being presented in these bite size, very ear worthy, very friendly to the ear type of way. And when you do that, you're likely to get an audience to remember what you said. You're likely to have a journalist write down what you said. These are things that are very important when you're thinking about your supporting messaging. So sound bites. So thinking about saying things in a way that's 
uh, ear friendly or or friendly to the ear is going to be critical. So I want you to think about it as, hey, this is how I would turn these words around, or I would reorganize my statements so that it's more friendly to someone who's hearing this or reading this for the first time. So thinking about it in terms of sound bites will also be important. So remember, this is how we look at the, the three-legged stool of messaging, that that stool is built on statistics, stories, and sound bites. I want to share with you a quick, a couple of quick examples of some public health campaigns that did this, that that did this well, and by doing it well, they were able to really start to demonstrate the power of messaging. Uh, here's one that was, uh, this is the draw the line against malaria campaign uh, that was done by, uh, that that was done in, uh, I believe this was in Kenya, I believe is where this was originated, and what this campaign was built around was this idea of using that line uh, about half of the population struggles with malaria or are in places where they could be affected by malaria. And so that line, that green line that you see through the word malaria became an important aspect of this campaign. Now, if you think about it, it's really visually appealing. This, of course, is a public health campaign. And the reason I use public health campaigns is because public health campaigns tend to be the best at doing this. They, they are interesting. They tend to have strong visual impact and they have great statistics and stories to back up what they're doing. But the truth is, even if you're working in an area that's outside of public health, there's ways to do this. The Draw the Line campaign actually uh, ended up, by many exponents, increasing the visibility and the impressions, especially around awareness of malaria and preventative measures around malaria. They used this campaign so well. Uh, they kept the colors consistent. There was a lot of visual components that were on social media, on websites, especially in um, in uh, visual advertising that was on streets and in bus and bus wraps, and all of this was built around this idea of how do we keep it simple? How do we tell the story well? How do we make sure that we keep that line where it is and keep more people above that line as much as possible? Another campaign that, that took place, this was in Wales um, in the United Kingdom. It was a campaign built around uh, organ donation. Uh, Wales, especially their health commission, was finding out that uh, a hu uh, it, it struggled a lot with getting more donors, especially organ donors. And a lot of it was built around stigmas and taboos and and, and a lot of false notions around organ donation. And so they started using this idea, this visual idea of the countdown clock that people who are struggling with a very serious disease have a countdown clock on their organs. And they were showing that that countdown clock can be completely reset if a person is willing to donate. And so the, the motive, the goal around this campaign was how do we get as many people to register as organ donors and that number skyrocketed as a result of this campaign. How do we get more people aware of it? I think in the end, they found out that the campaign had reached something in the 80% of people in that community, in, in, the, in the community of Wales. And they had reached that many people, increased the reach of that many people because of the work of the visuals of this campaign, the interesting nature of this campaign. But I also want to stress with this campaign, they were able to use a lot of great key messaging, verbal key messaging, where they were able to talk about the reset. They were able to talk about the countdown, how important those words and phrases are. Do you hear what sound bites are like? They're very much uh, friendly to the ear. There's something that we're likely to remember as well. Uh, a couple of years ago, also, this is also a UK campaign. This was with uh, the I am number 17 campaign where this was around rare diseases. And a lot of the campaign was built around this idea of how do we elevate the plight of folks, especially those who are struggling with a rare disease. The number, the statistic, this is important, one in 17 people struggle with a rare disease. And so the one in 17 was very important. And so the uh, that number became important. And then we'd also wanted to highlight 17 rare diseases that exist and diseases that most people may never have heard of. And so these 17 diseases were highlighted and each disease was highlighted by using the personal story of a person who struggles with that rare disease. And so by elevating stories, again, they're memorable. These anecdotes get remembered. The people get remembered. And even when they were asked questions during different interviews and opportunities, I noticed that the people who were answering the questions were clearly going back to their messaging, tell their own story. And as they told their story, the story stuck 
And sure enough, the attention generated was tremendous. And that's really important as well. So this was called the Meet the One in 17 campaign. And they highlighted all 17 people. And in the process, they highlighted 17 diseases as well. Very important and met all of its communication goals at the same time. This was a campaign that was done, and I'll share this one as the last one for today. Uh, this was a campaign that was done around uh, around ergonomics, particularly around how what the the employee of the future would look like if we continued to sit at desks and stare at screens. Now, this is probably going to hit some of us hard right now as we're watching this, but uh, the 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 campaign was showing how. Research is showing us that people who sit at their desks all day, who are staring at screens all day, they are eventually going to have health impacts that we are not thinking about yet because we assume that, hey, whatever, I'll be okay later. And so rather than just releasing the data, this, the researchers worked together with a PR and advertising firm in London to create this character, Emma. She's an actually a, a, a robot figure who represents the employee of the future. And you'll notice some things about Emma. Emma's got a major hunch on her back and she's kind of hunched forward. Uh, she's actually going to be shorter than the typical woman of today. So she's going to be the woman of the future, the employee of the future. She's going to be shorter. She's going to be hunched over. Her hands are going to be smaller. Her skin is going to be paler. Uh, it, some of the things we can't see is her eyesight is really bad. Uh, they also showed that she actually has more um, nose hair growth and things like that and ear hair growth because of all the dust and particles that she's constantly around. All of it was to demonstrate something to all employees. And so they would put Emma at big office buildings all over the country and show, show her off because it was a way to show this is the way we're going unless we start to look at the research. And it drove massive attention to the research, to the problem of getting people up and moving during the day, constantly not living the sedentary life, not always staring at screens constantly. And by doing that, they were able to get a public health outcome, a massive change in, in, uh, in behavior, but also awareness and perception. The way that these campaigns were messaged is critical. All of them were messaged around simplicity. It's not taking a complex idea and keeping it complex. It was take a complex idea, let's simplify it enough and show the why this is important. Show who's going to benefit. What is the societal value to what we're doing? And then start to answer those specific questions and build up the key messaging using things like stories, statistics, and sound bites. So those are some of the things that we hear when we talk about key messaging. And so let me pause here for just a minute and see if there are any questions or any comments, any places in your own work that you may have seen some of this happen. And uh, if there are no questions, we can keep going, but I just want to see if there's anything right now. I'll toss one in there. I, you know, I think it's really, it's Mariette, uh, Professor Joseph. I, I think, um, one thing that this especially shows is the impact of visuals. And um, I wonder what you think about how to work those into your messaging. Fantastic question, Mary. One of the things that I, I keep seeing is there is a temptation, and this happens especially with executives, a temptation to just talk. If I talk, the, the world will just understand my work and how important this work is. I see this a lot with entrepreneurs and founders as well, where they're saying that if I just explain it, people will love it. And the truth is, no, think about your own life. I don't think we do as much as we think we do. When someone tells me to do something, I might be motivated, but think about how many conflicting messages I hear every day. Thousands of companies are marketing to me. Thousands of organizations are marketing to me. And I think the words have power but the visuals are so critically important because they're actually more memorable. And I think, again, our brain tends to learn by what we see, if not more than definitely at the same level than what we hear. So I think the brain kind of goes toward what we're seeing and visuals are critically important. Now, one of the things I would encourage any researcher or organization to think about is which visuals make the most sense, which visuals are most impactful. And I think for most of us, we would say, oh, as long as I can fit it onto a good poster or as long as I can fit it onto a good PowerPoint slide, that's what I need to do for my visuals. But I would challenge that thinking a little bit. 
if I'm seeing 50 PowerPoint slides every week, then I'm probably not as prone to believing a PowerPoint slide. This is why I think something like Emma stands out. Now, we're not all going to create an Emma, but at the same time, think about how those researchers were thinking. We've got to do something visually different in order to get our research to stand out. So I, I think that's where the visuals are so critically important. I think it's important to push the envelope a little bit with visuals, but most importantly, think through if if my audience member was walking past my visual or seeing my visual in some way, what would make them stop long enough and think hard enough to remember what I'm trying to get them to remember? Would the messaging come out through this visual? Or would they get even more confused as a result of this visual? I think the visual is going to be very important there. It's a great question. Thank you for that. Just a quick follow-up. Do you have any uh, particular apps or websites that you recommend researchers use? For, for visuals, visuals, yeah, yeah. Visuals, ah. You know, here's one thing that I tend to use a lot is um, check out, and this is going to be a little bit of an aside, to check out the award-winning public health campaigns. Um, when I say award-winning, go with, um, there's a lot of big uh, advertising and public relations world awards. You're trying to think about the, the Can Lions. So uh, those would be great for visuals particularly. Watch what those award-winning campaigns look like. So Can Lions... Uh, you're looking at um, in the PR world, the PR uh, PR Week Awards, the PR Daily Awards, the Sabers. These are all awards that you can easily access because all the winners are made public. And access some of those winning campaigns. And I think as you do that, you're just going to sit there and go, "Oh, that seems so simple. Why didn't I think of that?" And those simple campaigns tend to be the most effective ones. So I would say go the award route wherever possible to get great ideas and and brainstorm new ideas. And then, you know, when it comes to beyond that, if you're able to ever get some advanced learning or take a class in everything from uh, graphic design or visual communication, data visualization, all of those are extremely helpful as well. Thank you. That's great. Let's do this. Now, why don't I, and we have about uh, a few minutes left in front of us. Why don't I just try squeezing in one more topic that I think could be a little bit helpful, especially as we're thinking through, uh, thinking through some of our research and how to make it effective to more audiences. And one of the things we think about with our messaging is now that we have a strong message, where do we take it from here? Where do we go next? Um, and so this concept of talking to journalists about our work and about our research is going to be important. And by the way, I don't think this is a place to suddenly shut out the visual. I think visual is critical. Now, you might be in a broadcast setting where you can actually see visuals, but even if you are in a setting where you're talking to a, a journalist or don't hesitate to show that influencer, that journalist, something visual, because that is critically important in that in that um, in that motivation, in that persuasion that we're trying to accomplish. One of the things I want to share with you very quickly when it comes to speaking to journalists is something that uh, that I was taught a long time ago that became extremely helpful for me. Uh, was this idea of thought speed. Uh, one of the things that typically happens when it comes to speaking to a reporter or speaking to someone who's asking questions, an investor even, or someone who's asking questions about your work or your research, one of the things I'd encourage you to do is slow everything down, uh, mentally, verbally, just slow everything down. Here's what happens when we give our brain an additional fraction of a second before we start answering we tend to come up with a better answer. It's that simple. And uh, if our brain is processing information much faster than our mouth could ever issue it, then it's important for us to allow our brain to think through what we're trying to say. So I would encourage you, as you're thinking through questions, as Q&A comes, start by slowing everything down. When you slow things down, and that could be everything from the question comes and you pause briefly, or the question comes and you are using a phrase, a filler phrase, like, thank you for that question. Whatever it takes to help you slow things down, slow it down. Watch what happens next. Your brain will start to organize your responses. And here's the best part. It will typically organize it into messaging. Using your messaging, it will organize it. There's a system that we talk about when it comes to answering questions that we call satisfy, bridge, and steer. This is one that uh, we, we've used for a long time, this idea of responding to the question of the questioner and then from there going to uh, uh, transitioning or steering into uh, a concept or an idea that you want to talk about. In other words, satisfy bridge steer is really 
I'm going to meet the need of the questioner and then transition into what my messaging talks about. Trying this is really going to take some practice. I think for many of us, it's going to be presenting ourselves with the key questions that we're likely to face and then responding to the questions beyond just the basic. If someone asks me, uh, why is this research important? I could simply respond by saying it's really important because it will make uh, it will make uh, the cost of healthcare lower. Sure, I answered the question, but I haven't done it enough to then transition to what else I could talk about. Can I demonstrate the greater value of this research in people's lives by telling some of those stories, using some of that data, the statistics, even speaking in sound bites? Have I done more to build up my response? So starting to process questions or our responses in this formula, satisfy the responder, transition to my messaging. How can I do that more and more? And I think especially in the world of science research and health research, this becomes critically important because there's a couple of types of questions that you're more likely to get. Let me present you with one of those types of questions. A speculative question. Uh, speculative questions are questions that ask you to predict the future. Now, that can seem like a good thing, right? Don't I want to predict the future? But the truth is speculative questions are usually high risk, low reward questions. And so you might get a question like, how soon before your research leads to a cure? Or what are your predictions for this treatment? How will budget cuts affect your program? All of those are speculative questions. And any strong, good journalist will ask a good speculative question. But when you're responding on behalf of your organization or responding on behalf of your work, one of the things I want you to carefully consider is what is the benefit to predicting the future for your work or for your organization? One, if your prediction doesn't come true, it makes your organization look less credible. But even if it does come true, we can't guarantee results. So there's also that risk that you're taking. And so I would encourage you to think through how you want to handle speculative questions, especially using satisfy, bridge, and steer. Remember, you don't have to predict the future if someone asks you to predict the future. Talk about the value that you are bringing to the current, to today. Talk about the value that this research will have potentially down the road. You don't have to necessarily predict the future. One of the things that we often see in the world of healthcare, especially around pharma organizations, is how soon before this leads to a cure. Remember, that's not really the world that we're working in. We're not working in the world of speculation and prediction. We're working in the world of actually helping people. So part of what you want to do is make sure that you are predicting the future in a way that's beneficial to the person that's, uh, that's listening or that's observing what you're saying. You might also face what we call false premise questions. A false premise questions are questions that are built around a faulty premise. By creating a deadlier virus, aren't you threatening our entire population? This was a question that was actually posed to Boston University researchers recently. Uh, questions like, a uh, blank organization is funding your research. Is this just advancing their political agenda? Now, these questions could be built around faulty premises. And if they are, the first thing you want to do in your satisfy is address the faulty premise. Remember, if you don't address the faulty premise, the faulty premise becomes a true premise. So what we're going to do is start by addressing the faulty premise, then bridge to our messaging points. So uh, is uh, when we get a faulty premise question, what I want to encourage you to do is think about addressing the faulty premise first. No, actually, uh, I believe that I should correct what you've said first before we go into the messaging that I'm about to present. So think through those false premise questions, but think through it in the form of satisfied <laughs> and steer wherever possible. The final type of question I'll present to you is what we call an accusatory question. These are those scandalous questions, those questions of you are unethical or behaving unethically. Uh, why did it take so long to release this information? Lives could have been saved. How do you respond to allegations that your research is discriminatory? Did your team exaggerate to receive funding? As you think through accusatory questions, one of the things I want you to go back to again is satisfy bridge and steer. If your messaging is sound, every one of these questions, even in crisis times, can be actually very fundamentally simple to respond to. Now, part of it is going to be slowing things down so that especially when it comes to if we speed things up with accusatory questions, we tend to say things we didn't mean to say, slow everything down and then get right to the question. Why did it take so long to release this information? Lives could have been saved. The satisfy to that question could be as simple as, 
Well, we wanted to make sure that our results were accurate. We wanted to make sure that our data was giving us the right information or that our research was providing the right result. We wanted to ensure quality before moving forward with releasing this information. It, and, and that's why it took longer. But we believe by ensuring quality, we were able to do blank, blank, and blank. And you have your messaging right after that. Even when you're accused of bad behavior, now again, if you are actually committing the bad behavior, none of this counts. Please go back to all of our crisis communication work in apologizing and fixing the problem. But if you're being accused of behavior that you're not doing, that's where I would tell you, use some of that satisfy bridge steer to make sure that you are not being accused of something that you are not actually doing. Let me pause there for now and see if there are any more questions. I know we're coming up against the clock here. So any other questions? Tell me anything else there. I'll toss one out. Um, somebody smarter than I am uh, said in a, in a civic science fellows conversation that communication only moves at the speed of trust. And especially around those accusatory questions that you were just sharing, I was thinking about how valuable is it or might it be for researchers to share their personal motivations for the work that they're doing? I, I love the fact that you use the word personal there, Marriott. That That's one thing that really is missing in most of the, the work that happens, right? We disconnect the researcher from the research because we believe that's a necessary step. Uh, I think when it comes to uh, messaging, when it comes to communicating your work, I don't think it's a, a good thing to separate the researcher from the research. I think that if you have a personal connection to the research, communicate the personal connection. I, I'm sorry to use my wife again, but her mother went through a kidney transplant. And when she decided to pursue kidney research, it was deeply motivated by her mother's own, uh, her own medical condition. And so but I, I I see when she communicates that immediately there's an interest. There suddenly is a perk up of, oh, okay, there's a real personal connection there. I don't think it's a bad thing at all, especially if it's done well to tie in your motivations through your personal story. I think that's a good thing to do. In fact, when I listen to a lot of interviews, um, radio, podcast, TV, uh, even print, I, I, I tend to see questions coming from journalists about why did you get into this? And oftentimes the response is something vague and bland almost about, uh, I just always was interested in heart disease. And, you know, th there's not much of a soundbite there. There's not much of a memorable story there. But if you can say that something happened to me that motivated this work, I think that's very memorable. And here's something else it does. It builds your credibility. It, it builds trust. Like you said before, Marriott, I think it, it builds trust with the researcher herself or himself. And I think it's so important uh, to tell personal stories in the middle. Now, they're not going to fit all the time, but finding those moments will be important. I just want to say, you know, as a, as a journalist myself, the satisfy bridge and steer technique, once I learned that, it was revelatory to me, even though I'm good at asking questions, answering them was always kind of tricky. You know, you felt like you had to know everything, even things you don't study or don't particularly know to, to answer. So that's a lifesaver. Anyway, I appreciate that one. Of course. I had a, I had a student recently who uh, finished a job interview using satisfy bridge steer and said it was the most helpful way of looking at uh, Q&A <laughs> was, was by doing that. Yeah, I, I would say that as you're going through the questions that you might uh, you might hear commonly for your own research, uh, I think questions like, tell me a little bit about your research or why is this research important? What's next for this work and its results? I, I think it's important to even sit down one day and just write mm. down, type out your answers uh, in Satisfy Bridge and Steer. You can even put in brackets, Satisfy, bracket Bridge, bracket uh, Steer. <laughs> and actually write it out that way. And uh, you'll watch over time, you start to think that way. When you think that way, the answers just come out much more naturally with with, with uh, that type of thinking. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? And I have a question. Yes, please Tyler. So are there any other ways that, um, I guess specifically our community is a lot of um, graduate students and um, early career researchers um, is there a way that they can kind of make opportunities to practice communicating um, their research, um, especially to non-colleagues and non-academics? Mm. Wow, that's a great question. I, I do think the, the key word there is the practice word. So most communicators, whether it's in the executive side or it's a research side, 
most communicators just assume uh, that practice is something that happens solo if I even practice at all. And I think practice has to be something that we raise the level of um, to, to a really, to a real pushing the ceiling type level. If you look at the, the best communicators throughout history, now this could be um, executives, uh, this could be clergy members, this could be influencers. This is what something that they're doing that they're not really telling the rest of the world that they're doing is they practice religiously. They're constantly practicing. And so one of the things I would I would say is to first challenge the way you practice right now. I would encourage researchers, if you currently don't practice, that's probably the first thing that we should we should address. If you're about to present your work or your research in front of colleagues or in front of a group of people who might be interested in your work or not interested, I would encourage you to practice uh, first out loud. That's going to be critically important. Constantly practice out loud. Uh, we tend to have this mistake we make when we assume our brain will give us the same words when we're up on stage and the lights are all on us. It never works that way. And so I would encourage you practice out loud. I would encourage you to practice in front of people. And this is where it goes back to Tyler's question. How do we find those opportunities? I would encourage if there's a group of researchers or a group of colleagues that could get together, I encourage my students to practice in front of each other constantly. So makes little small groups where you actually practice your presentations and each member starts to actively listen and ask questions so we can practice Q&A and practice the presentation part. That's something that it takes time, it takes intentionality, but it's very beneficial if you're able to do that. I would also encourage you to practice outside of that world. So if all of your fellow colleagues and researchers know your work, then practice with someone else. Um, I was a spokesperson for a, a company, a, a big consumer tech company for a long time. And I used to practice in front of my marketing team constantly. And over time, I realized they already know all the same things I know. I'm not really gaining anything here. So I started practicing in front of the finance and accounting team. It was amazing. It was so game changing because they were asking all the smart questions that I wasn't thinking about. They were thinking it through the, and they were also benefiting by learning about some of the stuff we're doing. And so that's where I would encourage you really think about going outside if possible. Um, I worked for a company for a while that had a large call center. I would often practice in front of the call center employees and the call, and they would often practice their presentations with me. And it was a great little back and forth where we both benefited. And so I would encourage wherever you can find those communities to work on your research, to practice the research, the communication part, I mean, I think find those. Um, it, it does take intentionality. Go and find those communities to do that with. I just have one kind of quick follow up on this. Um, you know, so I often hear researchers being encouraged to develop an elevator pitch. And so thinking about the, you know, the points you just gave us about key messages and how to pad them out, what, what should people think about if they're trying to develop, a, I don't know, 30 seconds, one minute, three minutes at style elevator pitch? Yeah, I would say this, uh, Mary, I would say speak to inform and speak to be interesting and speak to be memorable, right? So those are the three things, interesting, inform, and memorable. And if we can start to think along those lines, even in a 30-second elevator pitch, I think we're far more effective if we can think that way. So, of course, an elevator pitch typically starts with, hi, my name is, or something to that effect. But what if we challenged even that a little bit? Let's say you already had met the person, and now you're ready to move into the next thing. What if you started with a question? Uh, some mm -hmm. of the best elevator pitches I've heard started with a question, a question that challenged my thinking or challenged the way I thought about a problem. And the what if I told you question or what would you do if question? And starting with that question immediately captured my attention. And then it started to direct my attention in the way that this person wanted to go. What if I told you blank? And then I'm sitting there going, oh, my research is is designed to, and then you start to show how it addresses that question. Nice. And then maybe you tell a personal story too, that after 12 years of battling this disease myself, or after 25 years of watching my parents go through this, and mm -hmm. as soon as you connect the dots there, think about what you did. You asked a question, you told a story, and by doing that, you actually showed your credibility, you showed your trustworthiness, and you showed your passion for something in 30 seconds. And so that's where I would say push the envelope a little bit. You don't have to be completely different, but you can still do something that challenges the status quo. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more question. Sure. Okay. Um, so other than kind of um, like practicing, 
are there any other ways um, just to become more comfortable with acting um, sort of as our own public relations mm. teams, especially for those who don't necessarily have the resource of media training? Mm. Yeah, I, I would say this, Tyler. I think one of the things you want to keep thinking about is, uh, I don't know if anyone feels fully comfortable being their own promoter. I think that's a very difficult thing for mo a lot of people. I don't want to say most people, but a lot of people. I think that's a very difficult thing to do. But I think one of the questions that we have to challenge ourselves with is, if my research is important, shouldn't it be communicated? Shouldn't it be put out there, right? So here's where I would, I would start to say... Uh, some of the steps you can take is small steps regularly, right? So for example, I remember when, uh, I, I know I've talked before to researchers who struggle with pitching media, pitching a journalist to cover their research, to talk about their research. They assume it's this impossible task to speak to a, uh, a reporter because this is someone that's not in my world. This is someone that's not uh, in anywhere in my universe of dealing with people. And so it becomes inaccessible. But the truth is, they're not. They're looking for a great story. They're looking for something interesting. And so if I've got something interesting, it's on me to overcome that barrier that I've presented for myself to, to get to that person. So sometimes that's as simple as sending out a, finding a podcast host or a journalist, someone that you've admired for a while, especially from a distance, maybe you've listened to this podcast and just sending them a note to say, I listen to your work. I read your work. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, by the way, I'm a researcher that researches this area. If you ever want to talk, let me know. That really doesn't take a lot of effort, but it really starts to build a genuine relationship. Now there's this mutually beneficial relationship taking place where this journalist who's looking for a great story is connected to a researcher who's doing great work. And so that's where I would encourage you um, take small steps, small steps like an email, small steps like uh, retweeting something from someone that you found interesting. I mean, that's a small step, but I think it's a very helpful one. I think sometimes it's highlighting other people's work. Uh, I think that's a great way to start to build that network of promotion. And then from there, I think you're trying to maybe even build your own brand with communication. That's a possibility. Um, most researchers that I know are, are shy when it comes to social media. And I think there's a really good reason for that. But I think maybe we can take a small step in that regard. Maybe we can highlight some of our work and the benefits of our work once in a while and start to build persona that way. So yes, I do think that that barrier is very common, but um, I think small steps against that barrier can be very helpful. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we are done? Yes, Dennis. Hi. Hi, Tom. Um, that that was a great talk, by the way. What you just gave us was tremendous uh, uh, advice. I, I loved a lot of it, and it reminded me of a lot of this stuff. There's a group of science communicate uh, communication trainers that are out there that are trying to push right now for sort of like a universal uh, program to teach science communication to every science student. Uh, and that means that everybody has a chance to learn at least the fundamentals of science communication. What would you recommend as the, maybe the five basics or however, however what would you think that we should be covering yeah. and that every student should have in their tool belt as they move forward from undergraduate to graduate to postdoc to their faculty position and so forth? Wow, Dennis, that's a terrific question and so many possible answers on that one. Let me start by, I think some of the fundamental communication skills are still some of the most critical. So that's really writing and public speaking. So I think the two of those can be very helpful for that toolkit that you're forming early on. When I say writing, you know, obviously most people who work in the worlds of science and communication are going to have some writing strength as capabilities. But what about going beyond that? What about media writing, for example, writing a great press release, writing a great social media post? Um, you know, we're, we're talking about how do I condense two years of research into 180 characters, for example? How do I do that well? I think that's the kind of toolkit training that really could be beneficial long-term for writers. Then I also think that there's a strong sense of 
look, can I uh, physically and visually communicate my work well? And so visual or data analysis or data visualization and visual communication could be very helpful. I think even the public speaking aspect of it. So everything from how do I answer questions well, how do I uh, use visual aids well, all of that stuff could be very critical and helpful, I think, as well. Then beyond that, I would get into a little bit more of the uh, media training would be very helpful and important, I think. I think um, uh, I'm trying to think if there's one more that I could really focus on or or or, or desire. I, I just think that there's a, a great benefit to having business training, business communication training as well. I think there's a and that could be my own bias because I teach that, but there's a there's a benefit there in understanding how profit and loss works and how uh, fundraising works and and I think understanding that and then communicating with that as the objective is so game changing also. So if I'm simply communicating the, the medical benefit or the scientific benefit, I might miss a lot of key audiences because I can't communicate the financial benefit or I can't communicate the business outcome. So I think that could be helpful too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's kind of what uh, what you were just saying today too is kind of what we're trying to boil it down to is, you know, that you have to know your audience, you have to simplify in the stuff that you were just talking about. Uh, being able to tell a story in there is so powerful. It's, it seems if, if people could just learn what is the story and how would I tell it uh, is really good. Uh, but then the nonverbal skills that go along with uh, being able to talk about this thing. And now I like the fact that you're adding imagery in there, too. The visuals that go along with it is an important point, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks for your response there. That's great. Appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, and with that, I think, um, uh, well, I, I don't think, I know. Um, our mentor chat um, uh, will have to end now. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, and so our 2023 mentor chat series is currently um, hooked up. Um, but um, if any of you have any suggestions or dream guests that you would like to chat with, just let us know. Because um, we're still, we got to fill in 2024 and hopefully, you know, for the rest of the years that we're here. Um, thank you again, Justin, for being here. These are all great points. Um, I've written down a lot of them um, just because like for my own career being able to answer questions and even just like asking good questions to get to like really great answers. It's very important. Um, our June mentor chat, everyone will continue this conversation about connecting with audiences. Um, we will have Laura Lindenfield from the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science um, to chat about how we can use improv to unlock audience connection. And so hopefully um, that mentor chat plus Justin's mentor chat will just like release all of this uh, communicating uh, energy from us and we'll just go into the summer um, with fantastic answers and even better questions. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye everyone.